I'll try to get you going um, and talk about not GI bleeding, which you see every day, but the one out of 100 cases you see that's going to die on you. That's what it's about, because I know that everyone knows how to deal with you know, er, uh, standard GI bleeds. So I want to talk about the sickest of the sick patients, and that's just sort of... I had a great uh, video of, of, of one of our patients vomiting like a two liters of blood in one go and stuff, but I couldn't get it HIPAA eyes, so I just can show you the results of it. So you walk in the room and you see like two liters of bright red blood on the ground, okay? Just to set you up, get your adrenaline going. And uh, I love to talk about uh, rare and life-threatening emergencies, partially because it's hard for people to criticize what you say about the literature, because there's not as much literature on that subset, um, but also because, you know, at three in the morning, you know, you can't think, you can't, you got to have an approach to the most critical patients, because they're the ones that, you know, you just don't even have a minute to spare to look things up. And so I really like to, um, to focus on those sickest of sick patients. First thing, what you're going to do when you see someone who's got blood emanating from the heddle area, okay, um, is to put something to protect yourself, okay, because sometimes those people will be having TB and stuff like that. Here's a typical patient at our shop. Um, you can see that, uh, well, there's some telltale signs here. Uh, you can see that uh, there's some blood in the basin, and so you're kind of thinking, geez, where did that blood come from? Um, and you can see that the, the, pa that the patient's got um, a little thing here, a booklet. It's, uh, I think it's one of the booklets, the patient's right to make decisions about their treatment, okay? And then also you can see that the patient is handcuffed to the bed, uh, so they can't really read that. So that's sort of uh, what we're dealing with. Um, the first thing, when, when there's a lot of blood coming out of the head, sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. And so these are the things that uh, differentiate uh, blood from the lungs uh, as opposed to blood from the GI tract. And so that's an important distinction. If you look it up in Rosen, I think it's still said in the last edition that you have to check for pulmonary macrophages or something like that. So that's obviously not practical. So this is the deal. Um, I should point out that... Uh, just as you're approaching a, a massive uh, GI bleed, you should think to yourself for one second, you know, could it be from the lungs, but also could it be from the nose? There's lots and lots of case reports of people chasing GI bleeds in cirrhotic patients only to find out that it was epistaxis. So the way, the way I feel about this is if you're not sure, it doesn't really matter in the patient who's really sick, where you're going to be intubating them anyway, you intubate them, you can see what comes through the tube, you can see for sure where the blood is coming from, and the key to making sure it's not a nosebleed is to see whether blood is running down the back of the throat after you've tubed the patient. Now, uh, once you've established what it is, uh, this is another major concept for all of us in emergency medicine, whether we're talking about an aortic dissection or a AAA or a STEMI, uh, you know, you're never go you, it doesn't matter how good a recess you run, uh, it's not going to be worth it if you don't have your colleagues to kind of take the next, next step and take it from there. And so, um, you know that, right? You can get a AAA, you can put in a line above, a line below, you can have blood in them, you can have that done and, and be a, a superstar, but of course, you know, they'll die if they don't immediately have transition to the operating room. So you really have to be thinking from the very moment that you see a bad case like this. You know, I kind of, I kind of think of it like this. I walk, as I'm walking into the room and protecting myself, I'm asking the clerk, hey, who's on for IR? Who's on for, you know, so you should know within your own practice realm what that next step is going to be so you can have them ready for when you've finished the recess. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the basic principles. So airway and breathing, this is the, uh, the, the point. You've got to put a non-rebreather on them right away. These days I'm also putting, I don't know if you guys are doing this, these days I'm also putting nasal cannula on people because during the intubation process that gives you a few more seconds of, uh, of good sats before they start to tank. So I think that's a good idea. So you just put a nasal cannula along with the mask and then when the mask comes off to intubate, you still have the nasal cannula. If you guys don't do that, you should do it. It's really a good trick. Um, but anyway, I intubate all these people um, with uh, Atomidate and Sucks and I don't care about this, you know, the, the controversy about Atomidate doesn't affect me. Um, certainly they're not septic patients, so, you know, I think that's the best thing to do. You want to use that drug, I think, uh, if you can because of its hemodynamic properties, so that's what I do. So you pre-oxygenate them from the very beginning, you're going to have these patients intubated, it's obvious, blood is all over the place, they're dying. Crystalloid versus colloid, uh, you know, a lot of us grew up using colloid for liver patients. Uh, uh, there's no evidence, and it's been studied over and over again, uh, that it, it's a value to use colloid in the initial resuscitation. So just plain saline is okay. Um, and then, of course, packed cells and the level one transfuser. Now, just to, to, to pause for a second, um, you guys all know that when it comes to penetrating torso trauma, we learned you know, a decade and a half ago uh, that it might not be a good idea to give them too much fluid, right? It might make things worse. 
When it comes to GI bleeding, there's no evidence to tell us how much saline should we give, how much blood should we give. There's nothing out there. But there is some suggestion uh, that, you know, say a patient is, comes in with that GI bleed, their pressure is maybe 95 or 100 systolic, they're mentating okay. There is some suggestion that you ought to stop at that point, that you don't need to keep pouring blood and fluids into a patient if they're mentating and they're perfusing, because there is, again, some suggestion that that might actually make them re-bleed, okay, because you're putting too much volume in. So that's sort of the, the, uh, the best advice I have at this time. Um, yesterday we were talking about other patients that are bleeding. When patients are bleeding to death, you empirically give them whatever you think you need to give them to make the bleeding stop. If they look like they're a pregnant man, like a lot of our patients do, they look like a liver patient, you give them FFP, no questions asked, right away, right from the very beginning. You're not going to be criticized too much uh, if you have to stop that because you find out that they really didn't have a problem with their INR. You need to empirically treat these people. If you think that they have a platelet problem or they had a low platelets in the computer the last week, give them platelets empirically. If they're on aspirin and they're bleeding to death, I give them platelets too. It might not be 100% effective, but I do it. DDAVP is for patients with end-stage renal disease. Anyone with end-stage renal disease bleeding to death, bang, DDAVP. Okay, that's something that's safe and it stops them bleeding. Um, there was an announcement yesterday uh, in the New York Times that the FDA has now approved uh, a PCC, which is, the, uh, which is basically better than FFP. It works faster, it works longer, and there's a lot of different brands, and some of you have experience using them, and they use them a lot in Australia, and they use them in Canada. Um, those are, they're, they're faster, they work better, and they require less volume of administration. So if I have the option to use uh, Berryplex or another PCC, I will. Uh, factor 7A, uh, a little bit not so much. Signs from above. You see a patient who's bleeding, whether it's hemoptysis, whether it's hematemesis, whether it's bleeding tons through their butt, okay, and you see any scars in the midline of their body, that's what I call a sign from above. And that above sign is telling you to get that patient out of your emergency department. Okay, you don't want to be scoping them, you don't want to be screwing around with them in the ER, because anyone who's got a midline incision who's bleeding a lot, Okay, you got to assume that it's some type of fistula with their great vessels, whether it's an aortic enteric fistula or a fistula up here. That's something that I want to get them scoped or whatever they need in the OR so that there's people ready to open them up and fix it. Same thing with that. You get someone who's bleeding tons from their uh, hematemesis, massive, and they got an x-ray that, that looks like that, assume that they've got some sort of aneurysm in a fistula. Okay, first question, how do I distinguish an, a lower from an upper GI bleed? Now, you can be duped either way, and you guys know that. If you've got bright red blood per rectum, if you're vomiting blood, it's obviously upper. But if you have bright red blood per rectum, you know, it could go either way. It could be a lower GI bleed. It could be a brisk upper GI bleed. You can't tell. And the message for today is when you don't know, you assume that it's upper. Why? Why? Because, because it's more likely to be upper. Because... If it's upper, it's more likely to be life-threatening. Because if it's upper, there's something you can do about it. Okay, so there's three good reasons to assume that it's upper. Don't skip on the NG tube. My comment there is that I'm, I don't put NG tubes into GI bleeders. I'm, I'm sure that most of you don't either because it's painful, it's inaccurate, it doesn't really help. But in these patients, the patient I've tubed who's just trying to hold on to a, a hemoglobin, uh, those are the patients that I will always put an NG tube in. And the reason is is because... Two major reasons. One is because that blood can make them encephalopathic if they're liver patients, and I don't want that to add to my problem list. And the second reason, and this is more important, is it, it, it's actually a vital sign. So, you know, in that patient that you're resuscitating re-bleeds, before the vitals change, you're going to see a flash of blood through the NG tube. So, that's, so it's really another a vital sign indicator. Okay, so that's one of our typical patients, okay, the pregnant man all the signs of liver disease, and sometimes it's obvious. They come in with everything that looks like liver disease, and you're you know, automatically thinking FFP, vitamin K, right, that kind of thing, and it's, you're, you're worried about variceal bleeding. Um, here's another uh, sampling of pregnant guys. I like the one at the bottom. The, the, yeah, some of them actually do deliver. We have actually a maternity ward for men at our hospital, too. But anyway, um, so, uh, so if you see all those things, you, you, you have an inkling that it's liver disease. Next question is, how do I distinguish non-variceal from variceal hemorrhage? Say, for example, in that last patient that I just showed. You know, 
even though variceal bleeding, of course, is something that goes to the top of your mind when you see a liver patient, actually, more commonly, they, they actually bleed from good old-fashioned ulcers. So you can't necessarily know what it is. And on the flip side, and this is a very, very important point, a lot of patients that look totally normal are harboring hepatitis C. The CDC estimates that from 20 to 25 million Americans are hep C positive, and most don't know it. Okay, and this, the reason why this is such an important, timely topic is because uh, you'll, you'll probably end up seeing at some point in, in your career, probably in the sometime in the next year or two, a patient who comes in with the GI bleed, doesn't have any history of liver disease, and it ends up being variceal bleeding, and they're dying of it. Okay, so just because they don't have any stigmata of liver disease, or they're subtle, okay, uh, doesn't mean that they can't be harboring a, uh, a variceal bleed. So what do you, how do you distinguish them? And here's the second message, is that if you're in doubt, you assume that it's variceal. Why? Because it's more deadly. And because there's something you can do about it. Okay, so there's our second assumption. And of course, if they have any history of aortic surgery or midline scar, think, get out of my emergency room, and I'd like to see you in the operating room. This ultrasound thing <clears throat> I hear is really popular these days. Is that right, guys? So this is an example of something that might tell you within an instant that the patient that you didn't realize had a history of hep C cirrhosis is cirrhotic with the site, you know, that has liver disease and all of a sudden varices is on the, uh, is on the menu. And so uh, we always do ultrasounds on our critically ill patients for multiple reasons. And this is one thing that would tell me right away, ooh, wow, there's something in there. Uh, either blood or fluid, I can take it out. If it's acidic fluid, I'm automatically thinking that this person could be variceal bleed. Okay, <clears throat> now, what should I do next? Okay, this patient's intubated. This patient is getting blood. This patient is getting platelets if necessary, DDAVP, fresh frozen, PCC, that kind of thing. What's next is octreotide, one of the safest, safest drugs we have. Um, and uh, you can give a little more than this, and you can do it by infusion. I have to tell you that the literature, um, this is not a literature review course. Uh, it's considerably more interesting than a literature review course. You can get really bogged down in it. Um, I'll just, if, you're, if you're particularly interested in this literature, I'll tell you it's a bear. It's really a nightmare to, to, to sift through. It's very contradictory and it's very difficult. I'll summarize it for you by saying that octreotide appears to stop a significant number of GI bleeds, all by itself. Okay, octreotide is a drug that is able to uh, um, uh, modulate the portal pressure and thereby decrease the strain through the, the, the pressure head across the varices, and it can stop a lot of uh, GI bleeds all on its own. It's a confusing literature, but it appears to work well. Okay, so that's definitely the first step, and that in and of itself, if it's a variceal bleed, and maybe, maybe in some percentage of patients with peptic ulcer bleeds, will stop the bleeding. Now, say that's what's happened. You've, you're, you're, you've got a second to pause, and it looks like the bleeding through the NG tube is stopped. You've got your octreotide running. You take a breath. Okay, it's three in the morning. Um, what, what happens next? I still need to scope the patient right away. Okay, it's three in the morning, I still need to scope the patient right away, even though the vitals have normalized, for example, and the patient is stable, okay? I'm gonna show you this picture of this gentleman here, and I wanna ask, now who's Canadian? Where are the Canadians? Hands up. If you don't put your hands up, we can tell who you are anyway. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Now, does anyone know this person here? Do you work with him, anyone? He, he, he's, a, he's a GI doc in Alberta, and this is a very important uh, paper because you actually might be quoted this paper at three in the morning when you call them to get them to come in. So I want to read to you what he said. Evidence from a multitude of clinical trials and meta-analyses comparing endoscopic okay, versus pharmacologic treatments, we're basically talking about octreotide, okay, uh, suggests near equivalence in the efficacy for the initial hemostasis, the mortality, and the rate of rebleeding. This raises the question of whether on-call gastroenterologists should be performing emergency endoscopic treatment in the middle of the night or start pharmacologic treatment, meaning you start pharmacologic treatment, and delay endoscopy until optimal patient and working conditions the next morning. Although the literature cannot definitively answer the question posed, the authors as it turns out, our gastroenterologist, suggests that, de that delaying endoscopic treatment until the next morning may be the most reasonable and practical approach. What do you think of that? 
How does that make you feel? Well, I'm pointing this out because this is the kind of thing that, that you might be shown, saying, I'm not coming in. There's a near equivalence of what I'm going to do through my scope and your octreotide, and it's very confusing literature, and so let's wait till the optimal conditions uh, exist. What's wrong with this paper? What's wrong with this thinking? It's the same type of, let's just pause for a second and step back. This is a, the same type of uh, thinking and paper that we see in many, many different uh, situations. Like another one, for example, is appendicitis. A study that compares people where the surgeon comes in at three in the morning to operate versus the one where the surgeon waits for optimal conditions the next morning. The, 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 uh, the ENT case where there's a kid who has a foreign body and a little bit of strider but they're holding stable at three in the morning versus them getting their scope from the ENT or, uh, doc in the, in the morning when optimal patient uh, conditions exist, okay? All of these types of papers shouldn't exist. They shouldn't be published. And the reason is, is because they're all the same type of papers. They retrospectively look back and they compare the patients that, for example, got scoped at three in the morning versus the ones that didn't. And they find out, oh, there's no big difference between those two groups. Or the patients that got scoped in the morning actually did better. Why did they do better? Well, there was naturally a reason why the ER doctor pushed for the patient to get scoped at 3 in the morning. The patients that got the things in the middle of the night are, as you would expect, sicker. I mean, it's just a logical uh, thing. And so you, you need to be aware of this, uh, that it's not acceptable, I don't think, from our point of view, to wait till the next morning uh, because there's no evidence to suggest this. This is just fallacious, okay? So be prepared for that argument and know how to counter it. What else can I do? Well, balloon tamponade. Usually when I do this talk, um, I actually bring the, uh, the equipment in and I you know, have people play with it and stuff. And this is kind of a big group, so it's hard to do. So I'll show you pictures. Um, but basically, you're going to think about putting down uh, some sort of a tube, uh, a tamponade tube, and they'll show you a couple of different pictures. If the patient is still bleeding despite octreotide, obviously, um, Sometimes what happens is the, uh, the uh, GI doc will come in and they'll look down and all they'll see is red and they'll be over, overwhelmed and then you'll, you know, they turn white. Uh, and then you have to sort of figure out what to do. And I think for a lot of people that work in uh, uh, remote or rural environments, uh, if you're going to transfer a patient like this, uh, you know, for four hours and you suspect that it uh, could be variceal bleeding, it's, it's, it's reasonable to put a tube in in that case because the tubes are really good at stopping the bleeding as long as they're in, in place. I don't know what you guys have at your shop. We use Linton tubes at ours. Some people have Minnesota tubes and there's Stake and Blakemore tubes. I prefer the simpler design of the Linton tube. Uh, here's, here it is in place. And you can see, I mean, I don't really need to show you. I mean, everyone kind of remembers this from, from their med school about how this works. The varices are at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach and the balloon, basically, when it's filled up, you can see tamponades those vessels. And so that's a, a balloon that's in good place. And the other thing about this is very helpful is that there's ports here and there's ports here so that not only is this therapeutic, but it's diagnostic. So, for example, you can see if there's still blood coming through here. Uh, an example of a, of a failure of this would be if the bleeding was really coming from the stomach and you inflated the balloon properly here, you would still see bright red blood coming from the distal ports. So that's very helpful. There's a, a picture of a Linton tube. Um, you know... I prefer the Linton tube with just the one balloon to the esophageal balloon, the two balloons, is because there's no, the, the esophageal balloon, uh, you know what, there's no real purpose for it. I think the major purpose of the esophageal balloon is to perforate your esophagus and kill you. So if you just want to kind of get things over with, you've had enough of the resuscitation, you know, you can just say, you know what, just, just blow that esophageal balloon up and leave it, leave it inflated and, you know, I'll take care of them. Seriously. The fact that they design a tube without an esophageal balloon should be enough to tell you that it's not that necessary. Okay, so I don't even bother with it. This is simpler. The other thing that I would encourage you all to do is when you go back to your shop, if you're, if you're one of the people here who hasn't had this type of case and hasn't had to use this, go to your supply room, find this equipment that you have, read the instructions, and make sure you know how to use it. The first time I had to use this thing, okay, and what I do in my demonstrations, is I showed what happened to me. I put you know, what's the biggest syringe we have? 60 cc syringe, right? So I put 60 cc's in thinking I'd filled up the balloon, and the balloon takes like 10 times more than that. These balloons can take up to 720 cc's of air. So the most important mistake that people make is just not knowing the equipment and how it works. In order to get that shape of the balloon, you have to put a lot of cc's of air into that. Okay? So 
I really encourage you to do that. You, you, you've all been to codes where you're like, you ask for a, an oral airway and a, and a nursing assistant hands you a nasal trumpet, right? That kind of thing. Know the equipment. That's the big pitfall here. Um, here's an example of the tube in a patient. Okay, and so they have to be intubated. Uh, the tube is easy to put down because if you blow the balloon up in the esophagus, it could kill them. You're supposed to take an x-ray, which looks like this, before you actually inflate the balloon. I have to be honest, sometimes, you know, there's, there isn't time. Uh, and I've done them without x-rays before and I've taken the risk, but you should get an x-ray. And you can see the balloon there is inflated in, in the right place. I'm going to show you a little video. I feel the weight of the, the wrong direction. Wrong information always shown by the media. Negative images is the main criteria. Infecting the... You have to have that kind of music playing to really get the point. Yeah. So what's that? That's esophageal varics, right? So that would be the number one cause of life-threatening bleeding, uh, statistically. And then here's a second video of the other possibility of what you might find. Let's see what we got here. I don't know if you can tell where you are geographically, but we're going we're gonna to look back and tell me what we see. We used to do all of these in our ER, all of them, because we, we just didn't have beds and stuff. So we participated all the time in these uh, procedures. Okay, now they're cleaning something off, and what do we see? Oh, oh! So that's what a big ulcer looks like. That's an ulcer that's bled. So those are the two major things, obviously, that we're looking for. We got, you know, there's a few other little tiny things in there. I had a patient the other day who had some sort of bizarre tumor that was bleeding in their stomach, but by and large, we're 50% varices and 50% uh, peptic ulcer. Okay, and so this is the banding process, which is the best way to de deal with the varix. And that's what it looks like when it's banded, just to, just to show you what we're dealing with here. Now, the next thing is, what pharmacological therapy should I initiate once I know the source? And we've also got some pretty good evidence for this. It turns out that if they've got a variceal bleed, that antibiotics decrease their rate of rebleeding. And, even, and, and most recently, that seem, it might even actually impact on their mortality. Um, and I think that it, it sounds like a little weird. Why would that be? It seems to be that the, um, the clot that you form is tenuous and uh, there's inflammation and bacteria, and if you prevent uh, bacterial growth there, it makes the clot a little more stable. And then, if it's non-variceal bleed, we now have very good evidence that the proton pump inhibitors, if they are given continuously, so giving like a, a single dose, because I've heard some people that, they, that you do that, you give a single dose of uh, a PPI, that doesn't do anything. And we have evidence that shows that's not, that's not effective. It has to be a continuous infusion. The moment the stomach pH uh, gets below four, the clots begin to break down. And so you have to, sustain, have to have a sustained uh, pH above four in your stomach. So basically, antibiotics, and which one? Ceftriaxone uh, or um, uh, a fluoroquinolone. Those are both fine uh, for the variceal bleeds. And if you have evidence of an ulcer, you go ahead and, and give PPI infusion. Okay, so what's next? As we go through our algorithm, uh, what is TIPS and when is it indicated? So here's the situation. It's three in the morning. Uh, we've intubated the patient, we've given them blood and saline and uh, um, uh, uh, whatever else they needed to help them clot, right? We've called in our GI person, we convinced them to come in, they didn't see anything but blood. They kind of said, I can't do it, we'll have to put a balloon down. You put your balloon down, okay, you got the scenario. Um, and yet, they're still bleeding. What is next, okay? Uh, well, there might not be a lot that you can do, and a lot of these patients do die. Um, and if it is from varices, and you do have the balloon improperly, if it's from esophageal varices, it's pretty effective at stopping it. Um, and you have to try. Uh, the desperation place to move next is the interventional radiology suite. Okay? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen... It, it seems like they're very a delicate uh, people doing delicate procedures, doesn't it? They're very esoteric. Uh, but in actuality, what they do is quite barbaric. So what they do is they... They, they basically take a, a catheter down the, the jugular, okay, and they kind of feed it down until they get to the liver, and then they, do, then they go like this. <coughs> and rip a hole through the liver parenchyma until they find more blood, okay, to connect the portal and the venous systems together. And once they've made that tract, they put like a little silastic uh, tube to connect them and make that a, a shunt. So that immediately reduces the portal pressure and uh, in the case of bleeding that was stopped temporarily with a balloon, um, can relieve the pressure enough so that you can take the balloon out and then the endoscopist can go and do their thing. Okay, that's, that's uh, sometimes how it goes. Um, and they like you to have the bleeding mostly stopped before they go into the IR lab, but sometimes, you know, it's impossible and they're still losing, and this would probably stop the bleeding. So it's very important to know where your IR lab is, if you have to transfer the patients where they need to go, 
you know, these things take time. Um, now, this is, this is really cool. Okay? We, have, we have so many patients like this, and obviously at LA County General, it's a bit of a skewed population. We have a lot of these uh, patients, uh, higher percentage of these patients, um, but a lot of them have tips in. They have tips in already, or they've been to tips twice in the past. And when they come in with a severe GI bleed, one of the first things that we're looking for on ultrasound is whether their tips is patent. And it is so easy to do this, and I'm not a, I'm not a sonographer, like a lot of the faculty. Um, you just put it on, and if you see basically the shunt working, you know the tips is working. If you don't see the shunt working, they need their tips revised, so you kind of know where you're headed. So as we get more and more of these patients, it's going to be necessary to have more and more savvy like this. And so do you have tips? And is your tips working? How about the surgeon? Do you guys think there's still a role for a surgeon in severe GI bleeding? Well, uh, I, I, my answer is yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love surgeons. Uh, from my days back in the north of Canada, when anything was going bad with any patient, there was usually like one wise old surgeon that could come and bail you out and help you. Uh, the surgeon's role has become pretty minimal in GI bleeding, but you know, if you're in a situation, especially for the folks that practice in the smaller communities and you don't have a lot of specialists, um, if you're in a bad situation like this, call the surgeon. There's there may be some things that the surgeon that he or she can do to help you. Uh, some of the surgeons are, are endoscopists, and there are some desperation surgical procedures that may be considered. So, you know, if you're in one of these situations and you don't have anyone else, I think it's a good idea to call the surgeon, at least to touch base with them. You pr some of you are probably thinking that you know, we made some assumptions here. What if our assumptions were wrong? You know, I have this algorithm where I say, assume this, assume that. Well, what if it was lower GI bleeding? Just like upper GI bleeding, where the two major killers are peptic ulcer disease uh, and varices, when it's lower GI bleeding, it's very analogous. The two major killers, again, almost 50-50, are diverticular bleeding, okay, which could be massive bleeding, or angiodysplasia. Okay, those are kind of AV malformations in the colon. Those are the two major things. Where, where, are those, where do those people need to be? The IR suite or the operating room? So as it turns out, at the end, it's all sort of parsimonious. If at the end it turned out not to be upper, it's okay because we're still in the right venues to fix the problem. Okay, so that's very, very important. Now, this is our summary. Okay, pre-scope, and this is sort of the mantra, assume upper. Assume variceal. Think immediately about interventional radiology and possibly surgery right off the bat. Where are these people? They're out to dinner. Give them a call. Find out. They might need to come in right away. Use octreotide empirically and don't worry about it. It's not dangerous. Use balloon tamponade if it's still bleeding or if you're going to transfer them. Um, and antibiotics if you see varices or if there's a history of varices and PPI infusions for PUD. That's the summary and that's the core thing I want to leave with you. Okay? Very good. Okay, how y'all feeling? Yeah, you feeling good? You got a question? Let's hear it. You talking about antibiotics before scoping? Erythromycin before scoping for the GI motility effect? Um, not, not, yeah, plus or minus. I don't do that, but I think that's reasonable. Now, are you guys feeling in a, in a uh, are you in a good mood? Yeah, yeah, you, you are in a good mood? Chris is in a good mood. Okay, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, have been criticizing USC. This, I've got, got to get something off my chest. A lot of people have been criticizing USC for not being that scientific, right? You know, we're the gun and knife club and all that kind of stuff. We don't do a lot of research, right? Right, Amal? You got, Ramal criticizes us for that all the time. So he, you know, um, and so I want you to know that things have changed at USC, and we're now pretty much big NIH-granted researchers. I mean, we're really doing well, and I want to show you something we're pretty proud of. Could multiple stab wounds be Here, just re rewind lives? that again, just so they can see the, the just go back and forward and turn the, the volume National up. National Institute of Health says it's possible. This is a huge go, step forward oh, in understanding the short back, and long-term health effects you can't, of go repeated back. Like, they couldn't hear the beginning In the 1.2 million dollar study, a test can't group... You got it. Could okay. multiple stab wounds mean shorter lives? A new study on primates from the National Institute of Health says it's possible. This is a huge step forward in understanding the short and long-term health effects of repeated stabbing. In the $1.2 million study, a test group of 3,000 monkeys were stabbed between seven and nine times each. Thorough. We used a variety of sharp-edged objects to see if they had any different effects on the monkeys. 
in the end, we concluded that they did not. Collins says the results were similar with baby monkeys, old monkeys, and pregnant monkeys. Results were steady no matter where the monkeys were punctured, in the stomach, the neck, even the eye sockets. The same was true for every species tested, from yellow-tailed woolly monkeys to squirrel monkeys, the small gray monkeys with tufts of downy fur framing their faces. There was a control group that was not stabbed. This group was merely punched. It didn't matter whether we punched them two, three hundred times. All they experienced was bruising. This tells us that the effects of stab wounds are more physical than psychological. Collins and her team hope to secure funding for future studies on the effects of bludgeoning and boiling. And when we continue here tonight, the Catholic Church officially denounces spooning. Laugh, have a good time, enjoy yourself, we'll see you in, a, in an hour.